All right, in this video, we're going to highlight three uh, different topics. That is capacity, bottlenecks, and utilization. Now, capacity and bottlenecks are covered in the supplement to chapter seven. So you don't need to know everything that's in supp uh, supplement seven. You just might want to go over uh, the areas that cover capacity and bottlenecks. And then the utilization formula that I'm going to provide for you in this video is not in our textbook at all. So you'll need to know how to do this formula to calculate utilization per employee or workstation. So um, capacity and bottlenecks um, and utilization, we've, we've been talking about those three topics all throughout this, this course, but wanted to just really quickly highlight some of the definitions for capacity, some of the um, uh, definitions for bottlenecks, and then just work through a couple examples of what that looks like. And then we will also cover an example on utilization. So capacity is the throughput or the number of units a facility can hold, receive, store, or produce in a period of time. It determines if our demand can be satisfied. Um, so when you think about capacity, most of us think, all right, well, a, like, like the picture on the bottom left, a classroom has a capacity of a few hundred students. Maybe it's 70, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 200, whatever it may be, but that's the maximum capacity. When you go to a restaurant, it says maximum capacity 85 on the wall. So whatever um, those are, those are space constraints. That's the that's the most that that area can hold. Well, a system can have a capacity as well. Maybe you can only make 50 sandwiches per hour, or maybe you can only do 20 oil changes per hour. So we have to understand what our current capacity is where our bottlenecks may be, and then we can address those processes through continually improving our processes, finding ones that are non-value added. So maybe we remove some steps from our process, and when we do that, we will improve our throughput time and therefore increase our capacity. So when you think of capacity, there's a couple different ways to uh, adjust your capacity. You have to look at what would be a short-term solution uh, and long-term solutions, depending on how big of a change it is to your capacity. So a very simple example of what that looks like is in the short range, you can only use the capacity that you have. You can change, you can make changes to your, your jobs, the scheduling of jobs, work orders, purchase orders. You can work a little bit of overtime. You can schedule new employees and things like that uh, for a classroom as an example, I can add a few people to a course wait list because there's generally a couple extra seats or there's a little bit more availability for an online section. So we, in the short range, we can add a couple students to a class. But in the long range, I can't, we can't get there by just adding three or, you know, four or five students per class. We would have to bulldoze Qualcomm Stadium and put in another uh, you know, put in the, the San Diego State Mission Valley campus. And so we're going to start putting classrooms there because our capacity over the long term um, has to be increased to support that ongoing, reoccurring increase in capacity or demand that we're seeing for San Diego State's services. So that would be an example of a long range planning that needs to be done to adjust for capacity. So when you think through capacity and demand, think through whether it's something that can be adjusted on the short term or it has to be more dramatic and done on long term type of long range planning horizons where um, changes like adding facilities, um, updating equipment, things like that, that are going to take longer to implement uh, are when you're looking out in the longer range changes to your capacity. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about a bottleneck. A bottleneck is the limiting factor or constraint in a system. We touched upon this or will touch upon this in chapter 16 on lean, but essentially a bottleneck has the lowest effective capacity in a system. The bottleneck limits the total output, output of that system. So it's called a bottleneck because there is a traffic jam at the end of the bottle. You can only pour water out of a bottle so fast because the bottleneck is smaller than the rest of the bottle. So it creates a bottleneck or a traffic jam. 
So another great example of a system bottleneck is literally a traffic jam where you have four lanes merging into one that creates a bottleneck. There's only so much effective capacity that can go through that one lane when you originally had four. So a capacity analysis helps us determine the throughput capacity of a workstation in a system. So we're going to look at different um, processes uh, for each step in a total process and see what is their effective capacity and are they the bottleneck and how that affects our total throughput for that system. And each workstation has its own capacity, uh, which we will see in this example here. So this um, example, um, I don't know what it is that we're manufacturing here, but you can see there are a few steps and the bottleneck is the time of the slowest workstation. Okay, so you've got three steps in this process. One is two minutes, the next one is B, and that's four minutes. The next one is C, and that's three minutes. So the bottleneck is the time of the slowest workstation, the one that takes the longest in a production system. So for this simplistic example with only three steps, your bottleneck is at process B. It takes four minutes to get through process B. We uh, talk about this in, when we go over single piece flow as well, when we're trying to calculate how many uh, units can be made using single piece flow versus batches. Well, the bottleneck matters because everything will stop at that bottleneck. And so therefore that's where the error is going to occur because it has the lowest system capacity at that step. The throughput time is the time it takes for a unit to go through production from start to end. So for this simplistic example with three steps, you've got two minutes for process A, three minutes uh, for process C, and four minutes for process B. I should go in order. A, B, C is two minutes, four minutes, three minutes. So your total time to get um, a unit through this process is nine minutes. Okay, let's do another one. This is a sandwich line. You can see that they have two lines uh, that create uh, the bread or the sandwich, I should say. You've got one person taking an order. You've got two people or two sandwich lines uh, assembling that sandwich. Then you've got one toaster and you've got one um, person at the wrap and delivery station. So every single sandwich that made that's made needs to be ordered, manufactured, and then wrapped. So for this process, your bottleneck is at the very end. It's with the cashier or the person who's doing the wrapping and delivering. It takes 37.5 seconds at that final step. So you're going to have a bottleneck of unwrapped sandwiches at the wrapping and delivery station. So there's going to be sandwiches sitting there that are done that, that are not being wrapped yet. <clears throat> the system throughput for this, um, uh, for this uh, sandwich line is 122 seconds and you get that by taking 30 seconds plus 15 seconds plus 20 seconds plus 20 seconds plus 37.5 seconds. A sandwich will either go on this assembly line on the top or on the bottom assembly line, but not both. So you don't need to add them up because they are done in parallel. Okay, so it's 122 seconds for the total throughput time for this sandwich line. All right, let's have one more example. And this is getting your teeth cleaned. So if you're getting your teeth cleaned and they're also doing x-rays, you go to the check-in and that takes two minutes. Then you get x-rays and that takes two minutes. They develop the x-rays and that takes four minutes. Then you go see the dental hygienist and that takes 24 minutes. And while you are seeing the dental hygienist, they are examining your x-rays. Then the actual dentist comes in, he, and he, or, she, he or she inspects your teeth and that takes about eight minutes, and then you check out, and that takes six minutes. Now, um, if I'm looking at this process, <clears throat> first of all, I know that my system bottleneck is at the dental hygienist in the cleaning uh, stage, and that takes 24 total minutes. But you don't always want to immediately address uh, the bottleneck. It depends on what that bottleneck is. I would consider this bottleneck of the hygienist in the cleaning as one of the only value added steps to me in this process. And if they're working on my teeth, I don't care if they take their time and do it right. 
So if I oversee this process and I see that what I consider as the value added time being the cleaning of 24 minutes and the dentist of eight minutes, if I oversaw this process, first of all, I would say, why can't we develop the x-rays and which is four minutes at the same time as the cleaning, just like we're examining those x-rays that would immediately save us four minutes by just doing the developing the x-rays and the examining the x-rays at exactly the same time as that person is getting their teeth cleaned. So that saves me four minutes in that process. How about the check-in and the check-out time of two minutes and six minutes? A checkout time of six minutes, that's not value added. Why does it take so long? So I would look at that process and say, well, why can't we improve our checkout time to one minute? What's taking us so long? Why can't I improve my check-in time to one minute? Maybe even no minutes. Can I just walk in and say, hi, I'm Brent, I'm here, and then I sit and wait until my hygienist is ready to see me in the back? Why is it taking two minutes? They already have my dental card information. They've got my credit card on file. Why does it take so long? So if I oversaw this process, I would look at the non-value added activities and see ways to improve those versus immediately going to the bottleneck, which in this case is the cleaning, but it's also the step that has the most value in it at all. So don't just immediately jump to conclusions and address the bottlenecks. Sometimes you might want to address the non-value added activities as well. Okay, so let's talk about process design and resource utilization. So utilization is defined as the fraction of time a workstation or an individual is busy over the long term. When we were talking about lean and continuous process improvement, we want our employees to be busy. We want them to be working. We want them to get as close to 100% utilization as possible. In manufacturing facilities that are job shops, employees are generally utilized about 70 to 90% of the time. Um, in, in continuous flow shops where there's automation lines, maybe it's closer to, to 95%. Um, some service facilities uh, have really, really low employee utilization, which is not great. If you think about an employee who works at a movie theater or at an airline at a check-in counter or a check-in counter for a hotel, they're sitting there waiting for customers to arrive a lot of the times. And then they're just sitting there playing on their phone the rest of the time, but you're still paying them the same amount, whether they're working or not working. So you theoretically want your employees utilized and working on value added activities as much as possible. So to help improve from low utilization to high utilization, first you need to understand what your utilization is. So this formula will help you to understand what your utilization is. It is, um, Resources demanded over resources available. That's a simplistic way at util looking at utilization. And how we calculate that out is you look at your demand rate, which is your, uh, it's going to be abbreviated as DR, over your service rate multiplied by your number of ser servers. So your service rate is the SR, your NS is your number of servers. Number of servers could mean how many employees you have. Okay, so let's do an example. An inspection station for assembling printers receives 40 printers per hour. They have two inspectors, each of whom can inspect 30 printers per hour. Okay, so you have two employees. At the most they can inspect is 30 printers per hour. On the manufacturing facility, they are bringing 40 finished printers to them. So logically, you've got two people, they can do 30 per hour, which means they can do up to 60 printers per hour, but you're only providing them with 40 printers to inspect per hour. So they're going to have some leftover utilization. This is a very useful tool, whether you're working in manufacturing or services. I literally created a model and I have, I, I look at all of the employees that I have. I look at all of the clients that we have and I determine how much time it should take to support that customer. And then when I assign an employee to a customer, my model calculates out, do I have an employee who is overworked? Have I given them too many clients? Or do I have an employee that probably has a little bit of capacity and is enjoying a little bit too much freedom working at home virtually? 
Maybe I need to assign them a couple more clients because they are being underutilized. So whether it's an inspection station or uh, uh, the amount of accounts that you can assign to an employee, you can do this kind of calculation and it's very, very useful. The model I created helps me to justify with my boss when I need to hire more employees. I say, look at all the clients we have, look at the amount of employees we have, and my people are now at maximum capacity. They are being overutilized. I need more help. So back to the example, we got 40 printers per hour. You have two inspectors and they can only do 30 printers per hour. So quest, uh, the first one we want to solve for is A. What is the utilization of inspectors? Okay, so our formula is utilization equals the demand rate over the service rate multiplied by the number of servers. So quite simply, you're just taking 40 over, you've got two servers, they can inspect 30 printers per hour. So those actually look like it's flip-flopped, sorry about that. Your service rate is 30 and your number of servers is two. Either way, you still get to 60. So it's 40 divided by 60, and that gives you 66% for these employees' utilization. Okay? So now for the next question, what demand rate would be required to have a target utilization of 85%? So they're working at a 67% utilization, and you want to get them up to 85%. How many printers could they inspect per hour before they're above that 85% threshold. Now, why this is important is, again, I do this analysis all the time. I don't want my employees to be overworked. I want to know how many clients they can oversee. So when I assign big accounts result in so many hours per week, smaller accounts result in so many hours per week that my employees need to do, I want my employees to be about 80 to 90%. I don't want them to be over 100% or they'll get burnout but I don't want them as low as 67% either. So that sweet spot for me is somewhere in that 80 to 100% range. So if I wanted to get an employee with a higher utilization rate, I would give them more work. So for this example, we wanna know at what point do they get to 85% utilization. And so to do that, all you're gonna do is flip the calculation. We've still got, now we have three of the four um, inputs. So we know that our utilization rate is 85%. We know what our service rate is, and we know how many uh, servers we have. So now we can calculate out for our demand rate in this example, which is these employees can um, uh, do up to 51 printers per hour if we want them at an 85% utilization. So that's how we calculate utilization. That's how we actually apply it to the business world, whether it's a manufacturing line or a service firm like I work for. This is a very handle uh, tool and formula that you can use to determine your employee utilization and how you can get to the place where you want to be.